السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد All praise, glory and thanks belong solely to Allah He is the Lord of everything in existence we ask him to bless his messenger Muhammad, to elevate his mention and rank, and to shower him with protection and grace, along with his family and his righteous followers, as he did with Ibrahim, his family and righteous followers in the past. Welcome to another episode of the Messenger's Hajj, where we are covering the different interactions and states that the Messenger of God experienced during his pilgrimage. We had spoken about how he interacted with his Lord, with Allah, God Almighty. We spoke about how he interacted with his community. And we are in the very final section of the book discussing how he interacted with his family. Um, we've reached the 10th section or subsection within this chapter, which is titled Mura'atuhum wa Muwasatuhum. So the Messenger of God caring, consoling, and watching over his family. So the section starts um, that the Messenger of God would care for the feelings and the concerns of his family members, his wives, and his relatives. And he would do whatever they wish to be done as long as it does not contradict what God wants. And this is a very key principle. So he would comply and go along with their wishes as long as it does not go against the wishes of God. He would also console those among his relatives when something happens that opposes their desires. They may have a certain inclination or a desire and what transpires is the opposite of that. So he would console them and make sure that their feelings are taken care of. He would show empathy towards them. And we notice this highlighted in Hajj, in the pilgrimage. Now, we are learning time and again that this was the mode of operation of the messenger throughout his life. But we're highlighting how this manifests itself in the Hajj. So we see his wife Aisha, Allah be pleased with her. He went in on her in her um, in her, uh, the place where she was staying and she was crying because she was not able to do Umrah. She was not able to do Umrah because her menstrual cycle had started. So then the Messenger وسلم, consoled her and he empathized with, uh, emp showed empathy towards her and he uh, took care of her feelings and he said to her, this is not going to hurt you or harm you. You are one of the daughters of Adam. فَلَا يَضُرُّكِ This condition that you are experiencing is not going to hurt or harm you. أَنْتِ مِنْ بَنَاتِ Adam. You are one of the daughters of Adam. كَتَبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكِ مَا كَتَبَ عَلَيْهِنْ God has decided that you would experience what the rest of, what the, rest of the girls, what the rest of the daughters of Adam, women folk, would experience. فَكُونِي فِي حَجِّكِ عَسَى اللَّهُ أَيَّ رَزُوقَكِهَا He says, why don't you just continue with your pilgrimage? You're not going to be able to do a Umrah due to your condition. Just continue with the Hajj and perhaps Allah will provide for you what you are seeking. So this is a nice way of consoling her due to the experience that she is going through. And we have this in our community because we have women folk. Sometimes our sisters get sad and upset in the month of Ramadan when they're not able to fast while other people are fasting and it may hurt their feelings. Whenever they are not permitted to do certain things due to a physical condition that they're going through, we should console them and let them know that this is something that Allah has ordained. This is something that Allah has decided in His creation. And that perhaps Allah will provide you with what you're desiring at another time, at another instant. 
And she said as well, Ya Rasulullah, atarji'u sawahibi bihajjin wa umratin wa arji'u ana bil hajj. So remember that the Messenger of God had taken all of his wives with him. So she said, O oh, Messenger of God, my friends, my partners, meaning my co-wives, my sister wives, they're going to come back home to Medina, having performed hajj and umrah. And I'm going to come back simply having hajj only. So then the Messenger of Allah instructed her brother, Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Bakr, and he told him, to take her so she can perform Umrah after the whole Hajj was concluded. Uh, so he went, she went out to at tanim an area called at tanim and she pronounced her intention to perform Umrah and she performed a complete Umrah. What's interesting here is tanim is this area right on the outskirts of Mecca outside of the Haram boundary. And today the place where she went out is called Masjid Aisha. So there is an actual building that they built in that space and many people actually go out there to perform umrah although it's not necessary to go to that very spot when a person wants to go outside of the haram boundary the boundary is a circle wherever you go outside of the boundary would be sufficient but this is to remind us of the role that aisha played allah be pleased with her in another narration he says yasa'uki tawafuki li hajjiki wa umratiki the messenger of god says look Whatever you did as far as your tawaf is concerned, that is sufficient for you for hajj and for umrah. So she refused. So then he sent her with Abdul Rahman to a tanim and she made a full complete umrah, a separate umrah after hajj. This shows us how the Messenger of Allah will give them options and at the same time will comply with their wishes as long as those wishes do not go against the commands of Allah. So the question the author asks, he says, who do we know today that does with their family members during Hajj what the Messenger of God did with his family members during the pilgrimage? Who follows his guidance and his example and takes him as a role model in interacting with his family? He says the majority of people today in our era in this particular in this particular topic, meaning interacting with family, are either negligent or excessive. There is two categories of people. He says, there is one category, we'll start with that. So unfortunately, again, there is no balance. It's an extreme way of either this or that, but not the prophetic middle path. He says, one group of people they will basically give priority to the desires and the inclinations and even the bad desires of their family members. They will give precedence to those and give them priority above and beyond the commands of Allah and what Allah loves. And with that attitude, what these people have done is they have crossed the boundaries of God and they have broken His commands and they have made themselves commit sins and made their families commit sins as well or permitted their families to commit sins. So that's one extreme. You know, when people talk about extremism, unfortunately, they only look at the right side of things, right? Say right wing extremists, right? What, whatever that extremism is, it's usually the people who are excessive, what we call in Arabic al ghulu So extreme excessiveness. But people don't view the fact that every extreme has a polar opposite. So the extreme on the left, which is negligence, which is the excess of the liberal left, the progressive uh, folks and their attitudes and their policies. Likewise, here in this particular instance, we see that we're starting with the left, with the negligent people. So these people, they're like, oh yeah, we want to take care of our families. So we're just going to follow their desires, whatever they ask for. So we'll just skip out on Hajj, on certain, uh, on certain requirements in the Hajj. We won't do what God wants us to do because we're trying to be kind to our family. We are supposed to be kind to our family, but we're not supposed to do so at the expense of the commands and the obligations. Another group, which is the other side of extremism, says those people are so bad in their behavior with their wives and their family members. So they have bad manners with them. 
They're frowning at them. They are uh, mad dogging them. And they don't even recognize that there is something called negotiation or something that's called compromise. That does not uh, appear in their vocabulary. They don't think of dialogue or conversation or consultation. They don't think about having empathy or sympathy. They don't think about making sure that people's feelings and their emotions are considered. In fact, what they do with their family members is that they are a general. They are a sergeant, like in the military. They simply command and they prohibit in a harsh, hard way. And then they ask of their family to comply quickly without waiting, without delay, and they don't accept any of their excuses. So that's another extreme. And that's not healthy. And that's not positive. You see, we covered how the messenger of God was Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The commands of Allah are the priority. But whenever there is a way to comply with the requests, with the inclinations, with the desires of the family, as long as it does not contradict Allah's commands, he would do so. So then he says, the deen of Allah, this way of life, Islam, the way to submission to Allah, is in the middle between the excessive, harsh, and the negligent, distant one. Between the two. Between the excessive, overbearing, and the negligent, um, passive individual. So Islam, the religion of Allah, teaches us to care for our family members. And it tells us to have concern for their emotions and their feelings as long as it does not mean breaking the commands of Allah and crossing His boundaries. So then the instruction to you and I is make sure you comply with that and you will have success. And if you follow it, you will have the greatest outcome. May Allah grant us success and the greatest outcome. He says, فَلْزَمْ ذَلِكَ تَسْعَدْ وَعَلَيْكَ بِهِ تَفْلَحْ If you hold fast onto what I'm telling you, then you will have success and joy and pleasure. And if you comply with it, then you will be successful and you will achieve a great outcome. The next section of the book speaks about التَلَطُّفُ مَعْهُمْ تَلَطُّف means to be gentle. To be gentle. Gentleness is extremely important. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Talattuf actually is basically making sure that the air is conditioned. Um, in fact, in Arabic when they speak about the air conditioner, they say Mulattif lil jaw. So it conditions the air. When it's too hot, it cools it down. When it's too cold, it warms it up. So Talattuf ma'hum, making sure that Basically, you are someone who has emotional intelligence. You are aware of your own feelings and your own emotional responses, but you're also aware of others that you interact with, their feelings and their emotional responses. We see that the Messenger of Allah throughout his life, but here specifically in the Hajj during the pilgrimage, he was a beautiful person to be around. He had beautiful words whenever he spoke and he would draw close to his family, to his wives. He would get close to them. He would allow them to enjoy his company. He would be gentle with them. He would even joke around and play with the children and, and, and entertain them. Jabir says, when he's describing the Messenger of Allah, so this is Jabir again, we said this name time and again, especially with the Hajj, because he has the long hadith that describes the Hajj of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, when the Messenger of Allah announced his Hajj. And then Aisha announced herself to do Umrah. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was easygoing. He says, وَكَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم رَجُلًا سَهْلًا إِذَا هَوِيَةِ الشَّيْءَ تَابَعَهَا عَلَيْهِ The Messenger of God was easygoing with his wife. If she wishes to do something, he would comply, he would go for it. This does not mean, again, that she's the one calling the shots in the house. This does not mean, as some people describe, she's wearing the pants in the house or she's the one that is leading the house. No, he is the leader. But 
A leader does not lose any of his status by complying with the followers' wishes as long as they're not going to bring about harm to the ship. You're a captain, you can comply with your people as long as it's not going to bring harm to the ship. But in the end of the day, you're the one who has to make the decisions. He says, there are many examples of that. Number one, we see him saying to his cousin. So this is his female cousin, his uncle as Zubair. Her name was Liba'a. Allah be pleased with her. Ma yamna'uki, what is preventing you? Oh, my aunt. So she was older than him. So although she's a cousin, but she's older in age. Ya ammatahu min al-hajj. What is preventing you, auntie, from going to hajj? What is holding you back? So again, look at the word choice. Ya ammatahu. He is the messenger of God. He's the leader of the community. But she's an older woman and she's his relative. And he calls her auntie. Now, I know sometimes in our community, if we are to call some sisters auntie, they get offended because they don't want to be known to be like a bit older. Now, we only say that again, from my perspective, out of respect. But if a sister does not wish to be called auntie and she feels offended by it, then I won't say that, for example. So again, we have to recognize how do people perceive that? So if a sister, even if she's older than me, my mother's age, she does not want me to call her auntie. She wants me to call her sister. Then I'll call her sister. She wants me to call her by her name or by her kunya. I should be able to do that. Here, the Messenger of Allah, again, we see his beautiful speech. He says, Ma yamna'uki, what is preventing you? Again, he didn't command her. He didn't instruct her. He just asked her. He asked her a question and he asked her in a beautiful, respectful way. Another Example of it is when he says to Aisha, Allah be pleased with her, when she actually had her menstrual cycle. And we've covered this topic more than once because this is extremely important. And every hajj, we actually experience things like that. And then the sisters just, they become depressed during hajj because this happens and they are upset and they are angry and it just ruins the whole mood. And sometimes it's very difficult to get to them. And then sometimes the sisters don't have access or they're not talking to scholars who would be able to console them or they're too shy and embarrassed but then their men folk don't know how to handle the situation properly either and sometimes it adds more unnecessary stress and tension so he went in and she was crying and he says ma yubkihi ya hantahu ma yubkihi ya hantahu what is making you cry what is making you cry? And he used again, a beautiful, a beautiful word, which means, what is making you cry, lady? Like, what, what is up with you? And also the narration of Ibn Abbas, Allah be pleased with him and his father, he says, we, and we've covered this topic before, he says, we came uh, uh, to the messenger of God and we were young boys from Bani Abdul Muttalib. And we were riding on, um, on she donkeys. And he says, the Messenger of Allah started tapping us on our thighs as we were passing by. And he says, you guys are my children, Abu Nayya, like my little children, my children, although they're his nephews and they're his cousins. So he says, don't throw the stone until the sun rises. So look, he, he had that physical interaction with them. He used beautiful words and then he gave them the instruction. Again, I hope that we can all learn these prophetic uh, ways of interaction that maybe you want to tell your child something, tell it to them in a joking way, and then you will see them just brighten up and smile. And if you tell it to them in a serious fashion, then they're going to be hurt. Um, one of my children now has found out a trick. And whenever I want to kind of discipline or say something, she looks at me and she's like, you look like you're going to laugh. So that's it. it, basically melts my heart and I can no longer be serious anymore. So I smile and I will say the same thing, but in a smiling way, it goes way further. So again, we can all pick up these prophetic traits. If we are fathers, if we are husbands, when we deal with our wives, when we deal with our children, to deal with them in the way of the Messenger This is one of the examples of following the Sunnah. Again, many people think, oh, he said the sunnah word again. All he's talking about is X, Y, and Z. No, the sunnah is the external appearance of the messenger, but also the internal attitude of the messenger and his character traits. It's everything about him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In another narration, he says, فَأَتَانَا سَوَادُ ضَعْفَ بَنِي هَاشِمْ عَلَىٰ حُمُرَاتٍ لَهُمْ He says, the 
the, we saw that the weak people from Bani Hashem, the family of Hashem, were coming on, on she camels. So he started tapping us on our thighs. ويقول, أفيضوا, oh my children, go ahead and make ifada, go out of this area. But make sure that you only pelt the jamra, the place where you're supposed to throw the stone, after the sun rises. In another narration, again, we're, we're seeing the different wordings here because we said he used beautiful speech. Ya bani akhi, oh my nephews. Or he says, ya bani Hashim. Ya bani akhi, ya bani Hashim. He says, my nephews, oh my family, because bani Hashim is the family of the messenger. Ta'ajjalu qabla ziham nas. Why don't you go out fast before the traffic of people, before the crowds of people collect and gather. Wala yarmiyanna ahadun minkum al-aqabata hatta tatlu' al-shams. But just make sure that none of you guys throw al-aqaba, jamratu al-aqaba, until the sun has risen. So then the author says, فَإِلَى اللَّهِ الْمُشْتَكَى He says, our complaint is only to Allah. He says, people that have deserted treating and interacting their family members in hajj time in this prophetic noble character. He says, who else are we going to complain to other than Allah? Many people during Hajj time, and this is what's scary because Hajj is a journey. And you know, in Arabic, uh, the word for traveling is Safar. Now, yes, Safar is related somewhat to the English suffer because there is suffering during Safar. But in the Arabic language, it actually comes from exposing something because you were sitting in a location and you exposed it and you left it. So that's called safar, when you move from one place to another. In fact, if you are to uncover your head, you would be called safir, safir ras with a head that's uncovered or exposed. So the scholars say that journeys and traveling and going out, yusfiru an akhlaq rijal It exposes the true nature of people. If you really want to know about someone, you travel with them. So he's saying many families, when they are on a journey with their menfolk, all they see from them is nasty treatment and argumentation and screaming and being condescending and mockery. And then also just bad behavior in general and complaining and bickering and being uh, harsh and being rude and rough. And then in sometimes, unfortunately, even during Hajj, they curse and they use foul words and they bring others down. That's really sad. But that's what happens when you're outside of your comfort zone. Your true, your true nature comes out. So are you going to be calm and collected? Are you going to be cool? Are you going to be kind? Are you going to be like the Messenger وسلم, or not? So then he says, I warn you and I warn you again from being like these people that we just described or from following their example. Because what that's going to do is hold grudges. And I know many families. It was during Hajj <clears throat> or during Umrah, a beautiful journey, that the root of the breakup of the family took place in. I know a sister, she told me a story. She says, I was, this is a sister who came to Islam. And she says that I was looking forward to Umrah. It was my dream to go and visit the house of God and to be able to see what Abraham built and where Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam performed the rites and where he was born. I was looking forward to that. And she says, when I got there, my husband flipped and it was the nastiest attitude that I had ever seen of him. And that basically was the beginning of the end of that particular relationship and marriage. So that's something very scary. So the author says, do not be of these people because that is what's going to start the seeds of grudges and hatred and is going to make the hearts separate and distant from one another. And in fact, this particular behavior will ruin the reward of Hajj. And also it will prevent you from having your sins removed. I mean, the whole reason we go to Hajj is to be forgiven and have our sins removed. So it says this is going to prevent us from having our sins removed removed and having Allah forgiving us. So we want Allah's forgiveness. And that's why the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he says, مَنْ حَجَّ فَلَمْ 
يرفث ولم يفسق يفسق رجع كيوم ولدته أمه. The individual who performs Hajj and performs it well, he does not engage in any intimacy that is not allowed because he's in a state of restriction and he does not go out of the boundaries of Allah. Fisq is all this behavior that we just mentioned is considered fisq. Fisq is not just drinking wine and smoking and doing drugs. Those are other types of fisq, but fisq also is inappropriate behavior towards your family and your loved ones. That's fisq, whether we like it or not. Many people don't consider that, that if you abuse your family, you're a fasiq. One time I told somebody who was abusing his wife, I said, that's dhulm. And the person was so offended. He was so upset. He's like, how dare you call me a zalim? How dare you do this to me? He's like, am I like Pharaoh? I said, you're not like Pharaoh to the nation of Pharaoh, the Egyptians, but you're like Pharaoh in your own family. So that's really terrible and that's really awful. So may Allah protect us from being of those people. May Allah allow us to be like the Messenger of Allah, who was kind and gentle, who was sweet with his family, who was able to take care of their conditions in the best possible way. Number 12, he says, Al-Ihsanu ilayhim. Ihsan is a word that exemplifies beauty. So basically, beautiful treatment. Ihsan also is to do things with excellence. Ihsan also is generosity. So in Arabic, we say Ahsin ilayhi, meaning treat him good, treat him nicely, and treat him generously. Ihsan also is our relationship with Allah, to be able to worship Allah as we, as if it was that we see him, but although we don't see him, we should realize that he sees us. That's the highest level of our practice of our religion, to be in a state of constantly reflecting over the fact that Allah is watching us. So when you say Al-Ihsanu ilayhim, it's for you to treat them with beauty, treat them with excellence, treat them with generosity. So we see that the Messenger's methods of Ihsan, of beauty, excellence and generosity with his family, with his Ahlul Bayt, Allah bless them, alayhim was salam. It was so, uh, it had so much vari variety, it was so diverse, he, it was so creative. So when you were, when you are to reflect over his experience, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, basically you would just have no doubt, you would be completely certain that every state and every interaction the messenger had with his family, you could describe it as ihsan, perfect. And that's, that's why it's called perfection actually. He actually strove towards perfection. So there is not even an angle of his treatment with them except that you would see that he was so kind to them. He was so generous with them. He was so excellent towards them. And like I said before, and we will continue, we can never actually enumerate all of these things, especially in a lecture like this. So we're just gonna look at some highlights. Some of the clearest highlights of that is that he wanted them to perform the pilgrimage and the rituals with him. What better ihsan than that? There is nothing better than that. There is nothing better than having the company of the Messenger of Allah. He wanted to reserve them that right. And he actually convinced the people among his family members who did not want to do Hajj, he encouraged them and he uh, gave them incentives to come out. Just like we mentioned the story of Dibaha before. When he came to visit her and he's like, um, do you, he, he told her, he's like, Aradtul Hajj, I want to go to Hajj. He's like, I swear to Allah, I am in pain. I'm not doing well. So he's like, look, why don't you perform Hajj? And then just put your conditional clause and say, oh Allah, I will leave the state of restriction wherever I can no longer continue. But what did he do? He made sure that even those that are not doing well, they can accompany him. What a great and tremendous honor. I mean, for us, if I was given the privilege of performing Hajj with my teachers, I would, I would feel like I own the world because it's such an honor and such a privilege. We're not talking about a personal teacher, we're talking about the messenger of God, the final messenger of God. Just imagine this, you have this in your record of good deeds. You performed the Hajj with the messenger of Allah. Now with his family, he made sure he was very keen on bringing them along. 
This is a great form of ihsan. I remember one of my teachers, Allah bless him in Medina, I would be so happy whenever he would say, I want to go to Umrah, why don't you accompany me? It's not because he needs company, he can choose anybody else. But he would take me with him in his car so I don't have to ride on a bus and I don't have to be in the crowds. And I would be benefiting from him the whole way and I would be learning from him and I would be consulting with him. So this is a great way of showing generosity and excellence towards others. Another manifestation of the messenger having ihsan with his family is the fact that he took all of his wives with him. Allah be pleased with them. This is amazing. The messenger of God had multiple wives. It wasn't just two, it wasn't three, it was nine when he passed away, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He took them all. Now, what was interesting is that in regular journeys, whenever he would travel on an expedition, he would actually have them draw lots and he would take one of them. He would not take all of them because it's an army, it's a military campaign, um, it's not for women. So he would take one of them on the journey typically. So this, this is something that's not just justice. This is not just being fair, right? Because we can see that this is extremely fair and this is very just. Because what he could have done to be just is like he did elsewhere. Because his method of fair, fair treatment was, okay, I'll take one of you guys on each journey I leave by drawing lots. That was fair. But he went above and beyond. He's like, no, this time I want you all to accompany me. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that's another way of what? Showing goodness, generosity, excellence. The, th the, the, the next manifestation here is the Messenger of Allah allowing his cousin, Al-Fadl, Allah be pleased with him and his father, Al-Fadl ibn al-Abbas, to ride with him. This is a great honor and a great privilege. He put him on the same mount with him and he took him from Muzdalifa to Mina. What an honor that whenever we read about the pilgrimage of the Messenger of Allah, we're going to talk about this man, Al-Fadl. And we're going to learn from his errors and we're going to learn from the good things, right? So we learned about him being a young man and looking at the women. Allah forgave him for that. May Allah forgive him for that. But we learn a lesson from that. We learn a lesson of how to correct the error of someone. Especially someone who's not persistent on their error. Especially someone who's there to do something good. So, um, we see the Messenger وسلم, treating him with ihsan. The next thing is his ihsan, his excellence, his perfection, his good treatment and his generosity. When he performed the ritual slaughter on behalf of his wives. Remember that the ritual slaughter is an individual act of worship so you do it from your own money but here the messenger of allah wanted to also do that on behalf of his wives and he wanted to participate and contribute towards that so he slaughtered cows for them without them asking him to do so so again what is this this is him taking the initiative sallallahu alaihi wasallam going above and beyond to ensure that their pilgrimage is in the best condition, right? He made sure that he's in their company, he's teaching them, he's instructing them, he's guiding them, he's showing them what to do and what not to do. All of these things are amazing. But on top of all of that, now he's going above and beyond by slaughtering the sacrificial animals on their behalf without them actually asking. And he did not instruct them to do it. He just did that on his own. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when we reflect over these, and these are just highlights and examples from the whole pilgrimage, we recognize the perfection of the human character of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he has actually told us about this. خَيْرُكُمْ خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِهِ وَأَنَا خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِي The best of you are the best to their wives, and I am the best to my wives. Now, ahl can also mean family. The best of you are the best to their families, and I am the best to my family. But 
your family initially is your wife. And this is again something that is addressing the men folk. Khayrukum, he's talking to the men folk there. And in another instance, he says, they're not from your best whoever abuses their wife. Laysaw bi khiyarikum. He says, they are not your best. So look at the polar opposite. He says, the best of you are the best to their wives and I am the best to my wives. And then he says, they are not among the best of you who abuse their wives. You see? So this is teaching us something in his instruction, but then we also learn it from him through his practice. Many teachers fail because they preach something and they can't live up to it. But the Messenger of Allah, his behavior was actually above and beyond the instruction that he gave because he did it to a perfection. He perfected it. We see that the Messenger's excellence was so uh, diverse towards his family members, we can't even enum enumerate them. Um, so, but what you want to focus on, because this is what we want to implement in our lives, that's the key. The priority of his excellence towards his family was whatever helps them draw near to the pleasure of Allah. Whatever helps them draw near to the pleasure of Allah. And you see that um, Allah Himself had commanded the Messenger وسلم, from the very early days of His ministry to call His family. Although the Messenger of Allah is the Messenger to all of humanity, but He wanted to give them a specific, exclusive invitation. And He says, وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ Make sure that you warn the closest clan members of yours, the, your tribe, your family. So the people who deserve my and your best treatment religiously and in worldly matters are our families. So he says, make sure that you follow this path and you will have great reward from your Lord. And you're going to see the great blessings that will happen in your life in the short term future and the long term future in this life and in the next. May Allah guide us all to follow the prophetic model. May Allah guide us all to ensure that we treat our families with excellence, with perfection, with goodness, with generosity, with ihsan. Ihsan is to perfect treatment. And that's why it is the highest and the pinnacle of our relationship with Allah. When we have truly dedicated ourselves to Allah, we become a person who is following in the state of Ihsan. So may Allah allow us to have Ihsan towards Him. May Allah allow us to have Ihsan towards the believers. And may Allah allow us to have Ihsan towards those that we are required to have Ihsan towards, which is our wives, our children, and our families. May Allah guide us all. And may Allah bless this beautiful messenger who teaches us these beautiful teachings. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad. كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد We ask Allah to bless this messenger Muhammad to elevate his mention and rank and to shower him with protection and grace along with his family and his righteous followers as he did with Ibrahim, his family and righteous followers in the past اللهم أعنا على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك We ask you Allah to help us, to enable us to mention you and to remember you at all times, to be grateful to you for all your blessings through our words and through our deeds, and to worship you and to serve you in the best of ways according to the model of your messenger Muhammad. Until next time, assalamu alaikum, may Allah protect you all.